Welcome everyone. This is the one I am most excited for so far. It's the whole reason I made a YouTube channel, right? I love night photography. I love teaching it. I love talking about it. I love being out there by myself under the stars. Uh, for me, this is a holy grail. So I'm excited for this video and I have to go over a couple things first. Stick around for at least this intro uh, because there are a couple important points that you need to know. First thing is this is not going to be a photography instructional. What I mean by that is I can't teach you photography right now. If you don't shoot in manual and understand apertures and shutter speeds, you can't do night photography or you shouldn't do night photography yet. You need to learn how to walk before you learn how to run. That's going to help serve you, honestly. Um, it will be the best thing you can do for yourself and for your craft as well. But if you are shooting in manual and you're just wondering how to get clean night photos, maybe you're looking for other techniques, I don't use any extra equipment. I use software uh, and a method called stacking. Stacking is my secret ingredient. It allows me to shoot at ISOs of like 10,000, 20,000. One time I shot at 32,000 and I get super clean results. Um, I actually get to shoot at night. I'm not doing blue hour blends or daytime blends or any of that. I don't like that. I like to be out there under the stars. I like to capture the moment as it was uh, and then bring it to life. So I use a method called stacking. Um, depending on where you're at, some of this might be review. Some of you might be lost from the start. Look in the description. It's going to be six steps, broken down, jump to the part you need to be at. Or watch the whole thing. Maybe you'll learn something. And uh, yeah, that's enough out of me. Let's get to it. talking about what we need to do in the field, what frames we need to capture, what we need to do to prepare for a, a successful night photo. And there's a couple strategies. A lot of people use star trackers that allow you very long shutter speeds. But for me, I want um, as little equipment as I can get away with for two reasons. I travel full time. I hike you know, long distances for some of these shots. And I want as little weight and gear as I have to have for that. Also, it's expensive. Um, software is a lot cheaper. So it also doesn't break. Okay, so Let's start with the exit. I have a 24 millimeter on this on this camera for this shot. I know my spot star time is 10 seconds, and you're gonna know that by using what's called the NPF rule. You can also use the rule of 500, but I recommend the NPF rule. It's more accurate. What the spot star time means? It's the longest you can leave your shutter open without seeing star trailing. So you can see that these stars are dots. They're not trails. They're not you know lines. And as you get up to 20, 30 seconds they'll start to become lines. They won't be these perfect spots anymore. But that depends on your focal distance. So every focal distance has a different spot star time. It matters what camera you're using. You'll have to figure that out by Googling the or YouTubing. The NPF rule uh, is the one I recommend. I know I can tell you from experience that on a full frame camera, um, the Sony a7R 3 with a 24 millimeter lens, 10 seconds is my spot star time. Uh, 6400 ISO. I use different ISOs for every scene, I'm not afraid to go up to 20,000, nor am I afraid, to, you know, 6400 is great if I can get away with it. I wasn't sure how much detail I would need in the foreground, and this seemed to keep my sky from blowing out. So that varies based on each individual shot. And what you should really take out of this strategy is use whatever ISO you need, okay? Don't be afraid to push, because you're going to see the next thing, the most important thing we do is we're going to stack our photos, and that's going to remove a ton of the noise. I it's, it's game changing. So down here, you can see I have 53 photos um, in this group. So if I select them all and just hold the arrow key over, you're going to see I took those 53 second shots consecutively and you can see the rotation of the sky as I took them. You can also see some uh, cars coming through, some light trail and stuff like that. But that's not a concern. The stacking software is going to fix all of that. So the way that works, it takes 53 identical photos taken at you know, consecutively, approximately the same time, and it compares them pixel for pixel to say what is noise, what should be there. It accounts for the rotation of the of the stars, everything. So all you have to do in the field is get your settings dialed in right with your spot star time. Write that down if you need to. Then we need to use uh, our wide open aperture. You know, I think this was technically a 1.4 lens, but usually those cheaper lenses at the extremes don't work as well, and you want to step them back one or two notches. 
Um, so I went 1.8 with this, uh, and I went ISO 6400. I honestly could have shot this at 10,000, even up to you know 12.6 or something. Um, I don't fuss the ISOs too much. I make sure the shot looks looks like what I need. If I went higher, as I recall, for this shot, it started to lose detail in Neowise Comet here. That's what we're looking at, by the way. This is the Neowise Comet that was here this summer. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, in the field, spot star time, uh, wide open aperture, your ISO as high as you need it to be, shoot the same shot. Now, I have 55 here. That's more than I usually use. I just recognized that um, there was a very dark scene and I was going to need a lot of detail. Usually, 25 is my go-to because I have time and I want clean images, um, but most people stop at 10. The way this works is the more data you have, the better it can correct for things like um, you know, moving branches, noise, cars going by. I give it a nice big sample size. There is a point where it gets to be too much, like 75 uh, to 100 range. You start to lose stars in the corner because of the rotation. Um, and it starts to eliminate some. So I found that 50 is about the highest I ever go and 25 is my average, but that's just a personal thing. And that's it. Um, we need to move on to step two, which is prepping these shots for our stacking software. So step two, we need to get these ready um, to be stacked using, well, if you're on a PC, you use a program called Sequitur. I use a program called Starry Landscape Stacker. That's for Macs. I highly recommend it. I'm not an ambassador or anything. I don't get anything for saying this. I just use it a ton, have been for years, and uh, I think it was $60 one-time fee, and now I don't have to carry around star trackers everywhere. Uh, so I use it all the time. But uh, the first thing we need to go is go into the develop module. I'm going to hit hotkey D. And there is no, there's a couple things that you have to do to prepare them. So I'll go through those first. First, you need to make sure that you have a custom white balance set. You can do that by either going down to custom, or you can just do that by actually adjusting your white balance. And in this case, I think it's a bit too much towards the yellow to start. I want it to be towards bluish purple black if I can get it there. Um but I'm not sure I'll be able to for this shot. So the reason I like my night photos to look like a, a dark black sky with white stars, because that's how it appears when you're actually standing out there. But it doesn't tend to pick up that way. So anyway, I try to get towards the dark, the black to blue, the, the deep blues maybe over to purple, but get rid of the green and the, and the yellow. And again, personal, personal uh, style and what I like. Uh, the next thing you have to do is go down to the detail and turn off all of your sharpening. You don't want any sharpening going on here. Uh, you could turn off the noise reduction color. It recommended doing that when I watched the tutorial for the stacking software, but I have not found the results to be as good as when I just leave that on at 25. It's possible I'm losing a few stars um, that would show up as like blue or green or red. Um, but when I turn it off, the, what it does to my foreground is just unusable. And what I gain from the sky is unnoticeable. So I leave that at 25 personally. Uh, but you do need to make sure you've turned your sharpening off. You need to make sure your profile corrections are also off. And um, I usually just check that on. You don't have to, but that's important. Uh, the other thing is make sure you do not crop this image beforehand. I don't know why, but the tracking soft or sorry, the stacking software uh, does a really weird grid pattern if you've if you've uh, cropped it at all. So avoid doing that until after you've stacked the, the photo. So that's the things we have to do. Now the things that I recommend doing is getting your exposure to look nice and balanced. So I'm gonna start by lifting the exposure up to about 50 and yeah, it should be good. Now, I'm blowing out my sky a little bit, which I don't love. Uh, that's also why I didn't shoot at a high ISO, is because it was doing the same thing. Uh, I'm going to bring my shadows out and try to get that detail. And you can see it it had a, plenty of light to work with there. Pull, it's pulling out a ton of that. So that should be good. Um, got some greens to work with. I have plenty of detail and, and color in here for now. It's going to be noisy, obviously. It's very, very noisy, but we're going to fix that. And that's the beauty of this technique. Let's see. The other thing I want to do is get this my sky back to normal. I'm also going to do this with a photo that doesn't have the uh, headlights there. Because that's going to be disappearing anyway, so that one's better. Uh, I want to work with a photo that looks as close to how the final outcome will be as possible. So let's go 50, about up to 85, and I'm going to use a graduated filter here to get my sky back to a darker color and just bring that exposure back down. Um, also going to try 
contrast a little bit here and cooling it off because it's got some weird tones to it. And that looks a bit better. And I'll do a similar thing for the foreground. I'm going to want to bring out a lot of detail for now because once we run it through the denoising software, the more noise it had to remove, the, the more we'll have to work with. So I'm going to overexpose it just a, a touch and hope that the software is able to remove all that noise I'm creating. And that looks pretty nice. It looks balanced. Um, try a couple other things here. I'm going to bring down the lights to get the sky back to normal, but I'm going to bring up the highlights. And what that will do is the highlights will only affect the stars and it'll give them a bit more pop, whereas the lights affects um, all this area that's kind of mostly right here is where I'm trying to uh, get that to balance out a bit. So I'm going to just bring that down a smidge. Um, let's see, I'm just kind of playing with these to make sure I have a nice, like I said, nice even exposure to work with um, and plenty of noise brought out for now that I can, that the stacking software will fix. The other thing I'm thinking I'm going to do is that green is a bit too deep. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring down the, the saturation of the green quite a bit and also I think the yellow, yeah, the yellow as well. I see some reds in there that shouldn't be there. It's not much, but like right here I'm seeing it and a little bit in here. I don't think there should be any red in the scene. I think that's uh, just the result of long exposures and, and boosting this a bit too much. So I'm going to remove that. And the orange I'm actually all right with. That's just my Neowise comment. So that one's okay. All right. So once we have all of our settings prepped and dialed in, we need... Oh, I never turned that sharpening off. Whoops. So we need to turn that sharpening off. Uh, if we look at it, lots of noise, and it looks almost unusable for now, but you're going to be amazed at the results. The next thing we need to do is select all of our images. Uh, I'm going to deselect this one because that had um, something I want to go over later. And we just hit sync. And make sure that check all is on, synchronize is on. And what you're going to see is this way, all of your identical frames have been processed identically. And that way, when we feed them into our stacking software, it's working with the same image and it can act accurately compare pixels. And so that's really important. You need to make sure that all of your shots, when you go out in the field, were taken identically. When you process them, you need to make sure they're processed identically, which is why it's so important to have your white balance set to, huh, never did set to custom. So let's go ahead and fix that. I don't know how we undid that. And we'll sync them again. This is why we double check. Uh, and you're noticing down here, it's, it's taken a while, but it's slowly going through and, and adjusting the settings for all the photos. So once that populates, the next step is to export it. And I'm going to go through the export settings in the next video. I have already created my preset, the Starry Landscape Stacker preset. Again, this might vary if you're using Sequitur, but um, this will be the settings you want to use for Starry Landscape Stacker. Um, first thing, I'm just going to walk you through everything in here. And then once we've done it once, make sure that you save this preset and then you'll never have to deal with this again. I literally just usually hit Starry Landscape Stacker, export, and I'm done. But I'll walk you through what the, those uh, export settings are for now. So I personally export to desktop in a folder called SLS for Star Landscape Stacker. You can set that up however you want. Uh, file naming doesn't matter. Video doesn't matter. File settings is the big one. First thing is it has to be a TIFF file. And the reason for that is every camera manufacturer uses a different image um, type for RAW. So Sony is ARW, Canon I think is CR2. So anyway, the Star Landscape Stacker needs a universal language and that universal language for RAW files is TIFF. But they are massive files. You need your compression to be none. Um, you need your color space to be pro photo RGB. And you need your bit depth to be 16 bits per component. So just set those. Not really a reason you need to know any of this. Just make sure yours match mine. Uh, don't mess with image sizing. Don't mess with sharpening. But make sure that your metadata has include all metadata. That's very important. Starry Landscape Stacker will use the exit data and it will know how long your shutter speeds were, how much time elapsed between shots, and it will help align the stars. Uh, and that's it. Do nothing and um, on post-processing and do nothing for watermark. And then we hit export. Here we are in Starry Landscape Stacker and I need to open up all of the TIFF files we just made. That's the first thing we need to do. So I go into the SLS folder where I exported all those TIFFs and I'm just going to click and drag over all of them and click open. And that's it. Uh, that's it to start, I should say. So quickly, while those are loading, Starry Landscape Stacker is only available for Mac. Sequitur is a program you'll need to use for PC, but they both do the same job. They both compare um, a bunch of identical images 
taken consecutively and use that to stack for noise reduction. Now that it has processed all of the frames, you can see a bunch of red dots in the sky and a couple that snuck down here in the foreground. We are telling the software what's sky and what's foreground. And you'll also notice that the stars have all this trailing, there's all this motion. This is the equivalent of 53 frames times 10 seconds each, you know, 530 seconds. So about you know, a little over five minutes. This is what it would have looked like if we just left our shutter open for five minutes. Obviously the sky is rotating and has motion um, and the foreground is static. So we're saying this should all be consistent throughout and this uh, should be rotating. So you'll need to align that portion to make sure that the stars go back to being spots and not lines. So first thing I usually do is just go through with a big brush and just kind of vacuum up all the red dots down here in the foreground. And there's something oddly satisfying about doing it. I don't know why. Uh, and then I go to add red dots and I just sort of line the horizon to help the software out a little bit. It has the most trouble when you have like similar color grades as we do here. The ocean kind of is similar to the color of the sky. So we just want to draw that little line here. And we're just literally uh, clicking and dragging to fill in some, some stars and give it a bit more information to work with. Uh, we're going to hit find sky once we're confident in our red dots and, and foreground. And you can see it did a really good job going all around the branch, going around the trees. Uh, it missed a bit. This is a rock, so that's good, but it missed a bit on the edge. So all I have to do with the sky um, brush selected is just paint along here and make sure that it's all blue. And I didn't miss any spots. And sometimes you'll have some blue down the foreground, in which case you'll have to paint ground and you would just paint over it. But this did a really good job with that. Uh, I have mask with islands of sky in here. Um, I pretty much leave that on default, but what that does is a case like this, it looks to see the in-between spots to see if there should be some sky in between like the tree branches. So good example is right there. Um, that is sky but in between the branches. It's not a perfect selection. It's going to work just fine though. So the last thing we need to do is hit align and composite. So there we have it. It's a uh, stacked version now. If we zoom right in, all that noise that we saw is basically gone. There is a touch of grain here, but if we compare it to what we were looking at before, I mean, it's dramatically different. It looks super clean. Uh, it's going to be a great photo to work with. So the last thing we have to do is hit save, um, give it a name, name, save, and we're done. Next step is to take it back into Lightroom, start processing, followed by a bit of last, um, what should I call this? Final touch denoising is what I'm going to call it. I have a couple techniques to get rid of hot pixels and such that we are going to finish up with. But for now, let's uh, we saved it, we can close it, and we're heading into Lightroom. Ported this back into Lightroom, and we are ready to finish off the photo, or mostly finish it. So back to the develop module we go, and I'm looking at this photo. First thing I do before I start moving into sliders is ask, what do I like, what don't I like, what do I want to achieve? I love the, the water in this, that soft uh, five minute exposure really gave it some nice soft texture and a kind of an ethereal feel. I love obviously Neowise Comet. Um, I'm going to try to keep this sky close to the same color it already is because it feels like night to me and that's what I like. I want to get some of the yellow or orange back into the comet. It, it lost a bit of its color. I want to see if I can bring out this blue tail. Uh, it lost that color as well. So I don't know what caused that. That was probably something I did, to be honest, but uh, I'll be able to get that back. You can see these nice tails just lost a bit of lust. So I'm going to try to get that color back in there, and I'm going to try to bring out this foreground a bit. So that's my objective. Let's start by bringing out the shadows. The reason I'm doing that is because that's all my detail in the foreground that I want, but I am going to be watching the sky as well. It doesn't look like it's really affecting the sky, so that's good. Um, so I'm just going to boost that, I guess, all the way up. Uh, I'm going to use a graduated and bring up the exposure down here. And it's all right that it doesn't cover the spot. It, it makes sense that the, the landscape in the distance is not quite as well lit as this part. So that's looking pretty good already. I'm going to boost the whites down here a bit as well. It's weird to me that it's a cement gray. I feel like it should be closer to a blue. So I am going to try, I'm going to actually do a new graduated filter, um, but about the same place. I'm making sure it's not really bleeding into the sky at all. And I'm going to use the range mask with the color selector. And I'm going to select eh, somewhere around there. 
If I hit the O key to show the overlay, yeah, it's not really affecting anything but the water for the most part. So I'm now going to lower the temperature and bring that water towards blue. And it looks like it's got some green now, so I'm going to move it towards purple as well. And it looks like, I don't like what it's done. I'm going to include more color because it looks like it's not getting all the water. And that looks a bit better. If um, Let's see, the easiest way to probably show you the before and after again. I could go to my history, but I'm lazy. I'm just going to hit delete. And yeah, that's. Um, I think that looks a bit more natural now. Maybe I'll dial this back a little bit. You're gonna, you're gonna do this to taste. So you might hate how I did that, or you might really like it, or you might go further with the blue or the purple. Um, that's up to you. Uh, the last thing I'll try is actually using the color tool and going towards a bluish, like sort of aqua. And actually, I like might like that even better if I bring that saturation way down, but keep that tone. I think that looks, yeah, to me that looks the most like how a ocean should look at night. So I'm going to stick with that. Uh, there's a bunch of cool little tricks, uh, tricks for you if you didn't know how to use any of those tools. And I probably went through too quick, but oh well. Uh, feel free to rewind. As we've mentioned, that is free. Uh, next thing I'm looking at, I want this uh, sky to pop a bit more. I'm going to bring up the lights now. And I like what it's doing for the most part. I think yeah, it's bringing this out a bit more than I would like, um, this sort of section in between here. By the way, these stars not being... You know, appearing to be in focus, that's the result of coma. So the Rokinon lenses are famous for having soft spots in them, and this is a soft spot. Uh, it's not a lens that I would buy personally, that's why I was borrowing it, and uh, I'm glad I haven't purchased it because it had a fair amount of that coma in different places. Uh, it's fine for the most part, I mean the photo still looks really nice, but um, I would invest in something a bit better personally because I do this for a living. If you're an enthusiast, I would probably settle for that because lenses are very expensive. Um, I should probably also mention what I'm doing. I'm trying to get this spot that started to kind of blow out um, back towards a natural balanced color. And I'm doing that with uh, feathered radial filters and just lowering the whites. Because when I lifted the lights um, on our tone curve down here, it really, I don't know, brought out a weird part of the sky more than I would have liked. So I'm just getting that back by lowering the whites selectively along this ridge. And that looks a bit better already. Okay, uh, I don't want to spend more time than I have to because I know this video is long already and you're not here to watch a post-processing tutorial. You're here to just see how I process my night photos and learn probably stacking. So um, I'll go through it quickly. I'm boosting the highlights to get those stars even brighter. Um, the colors don't feel quite right. I feel like there's some green in here. And I'm going to just move the purples up a bit to see if I can get rid of the green and before and after so far it's looking pretty good to start um, I will play with the blues I always like to play with the blues because they always seem to affect the image a lot and I like that a lot I'm gonna boost the blue luminance what that's gonna do is it's gonna make the stars even brighter and it's also just affecting the um, I'm not sure what you'd call this part of the water but you know the the highlights of the water so to speak it's giving those a, a boost, and I, I like that contrast it's providing. So I'm going to stick with that. I don't know if there's any other colors I need to mess with. Um, I'm partially colorblind. I mentioned that in a few videos, so that is always uh, a hindrance. I usually have Sophie look at my final products and then help me tone them accordingly. I'll turn the chromatic aberration off, or sorry, on. Um, and the last thing I usually do is just give that a shove and play with the, the blue primary saturation. First, I just really find the way that it saturates colors more pleasing than the vibrance or the saturation slider. And I think so even with this photo. If we turn that on and off, um, you know, that might be too much for some people's taste, but I think that's a really, it's vibrant, um, maybe on the edge of being too much, but I, I like color. Maybe that's kind of, maybe it's because I'm colorblind. It takes a lot for me to see it, but I'm going to stick with that for now. And again, this is to taste. It's just how I do it. Last thing I'm going to point out and take you over to Photoshop to fix this is if we're looking at some of these spots, you're seeing hot pixels. See that white there? If we're looking um, down here in the detail panel, there is a lot of places that have hot pixels and noise still. We need to fix that. Uh, that's all right. That's what we're going to do right now. We're going to go edit, edit in Adobe Photoshop, and I'm going to show you my final step, which is um, selective denoising and final touches using Photoshop. So here we are in Photoshop, and the first thing I always do is hit Command-J, usually twice. Um, I'm making new layers. I don't want to work on the background layer. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a couple copies of that. And for the sake of visual, I'm going to call this denoise, and I'm going to call this layer sky. And the reason is my sky already looks fine. I don't want to denoise it, or I might start losing stars. I just want to denoise um, the foreground where I've really boosted the exposure and have all these hot pixels to clean up. The good thing about hot pixels in the sky is that they show as stars. <laughs> you honestly can, can't really tell the difference whether it's a hot pixel or a star. So I'm fine with the, the sky as is. On the denoise layer, I'm just going to go up to filter, noise, dust, and scratches. And this does a really good job at just removing uh, the hot pixels and things like that, some of the, the dust and the scratches. The reason that it's called dust and scratches and the reason those white pixels were there is there was probably some dust on the lens, some really, really small pieces of the dust or maybe on the sensor that no light ever got through in 53 shots because it was remain there the whole time and that shows up as hot pixels also because pixels get too hot and overheat and render is um, a hot pixel so you can see that just uh, it'll be more visual in a second I turn this radius to two sometimes I do one um, in this case I'm liking two a bit better and I'll explain what that does in a second uh, I'll show you real quick if I go super heavy you'll see it very easily it really softens the image if you go too far um, but if you go very small one to two it does a good job of just pulling out all those hot pixels. And I don't mind my night image being a little bit softer. It's meant to be. It's a night photo. If it's too sharp, it doesn't look quite right. Uh, I'm That's my first cue that they've used a daytime blend or something. Is If, there's, uh, if there isn't a certain softness that you would have naturally at night. Uh, let's zoom in real tight and see what that just did. And I'm going to go to this spot because I think it'll be most obvious. If I turn off that denoise layer... Look at how much of that it cleaned up. We still have lots of detail in our trees and our foreground, but man, is it a much cleaner image. The problem is, I'm going to scroll up to the sky. If we look at the sky layer and we do that same thing, we've lost a bit of luster and sharpness to the sky, and I don't want that. I think my stars need to pop as much as they can. So it's a very easy fix. Um, I'm going to add a mask. I'm going to use the quick selection tool and just kind of click and drag along here. It makes a nice boundary, so to speak. Uh, if I can, I'm not going to fuss with this too much right now. If I was printing this for somebody, I would fuss with this for another two hours. But because um, I'm doing this just as an instructional, uh, I'm going to try to be as quick about it as I can. I'm gonna, I am going to get these trees out of there, though, because I don't want those to be affected. All right, that's close enough. Again, um, you should take a lot more time than I'm about to to really make sure you have a great image if you're going to print it. But uh, if you're just using it for Instagram, you're probably not even going to be able to notice what I did. I'm now blending through that sky layer from underneath, and I'm just making sure that my stars are back. So if I, uh, let's see, how can I show you? Well, you just have to take my word for it that the, um, the denoise layer is no longer affecting the sky. And you can see that because I turn it on and off, and it's only affecting this foreground, never touching the sky. That's what I want. I am going to potentially sneak up to this branch, and yeah, I need to just brush some of that back through. So let's go to back to the layer mask. If you're not understanding what I'm doing here, guys, don't worry. Um, you're not going to get this yet. This is not for beginners. I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, if you do understand what I'm doing, hopefully you're at least learning some new techniques. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I can't teach you everything Photoshop related right now either. This is just to show you my entire workflow, and you can see how we take night photos and come out with clean images. Eventually, you'll probably want to learn a lot of the stuff I'm doing if you don't already understand it. Um, but for now, at least you've seen the process. You've seen how the sausage gets made. And uh, that's kind of that's kind of it. Now again, if I was going to be printing this, I would spend even more time really scanning the image for hot pixels and making sure that I haven't left anything. Maybe softening certain bits even more if I felt it needed it. Um, checking tones, getting some of that yellow and that blue back into here, uh, fixing you know some hot spots. I would go through at this point and I would make minor touches everywhere. But I don't think you need to see that entire step. Um, I think what you're looking at now is a very, very clean image shot at a super high ISO taken at night, not with the blend, and the results you can achieve with this method I use called stacking. So that's it, guys. You, you made it. I know that was a lot to take in, and that's why I wanted to warn you at the beginning. This is not for beginners. Um, you really need to love photography and be passionate about this, and you need to learn how to use a camera if you want to get this. But, you know, the great thing about YouTube is you can watch this as many times as you need, and I encourage you to. Watch it again. Send me questions. Do whatever you have to do, whatever is your process to make this stick. You're definitely going to have to go out and practice. I don't care if you watch this 10 times. If you never get out there with your camera, none of this is going to stick. I promise you that. I'm going to get out of your hair. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Send them to me. 
If you if you like this style, please subscribe. I'm trying to grow this channel. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of stuff coming up. As you can tell, there's a lot of techniques that I'm just scratching the surface of that I'd really like to dive into and explain to you more thoroughly, but only so much time in any given day on any given video. So that's it for now. I will see you guys in the next one.